All right, I, I'm excited about this. Um, this is kind of uh, something I'm passionate about. So uh, before we start talking about the actual testable part, we got to talk about just some basics. Uh, and this is kind of where I start when I'm approaching software engineering is that as a human, I unfortunately make mistakes all the time. And it's just a reality of life that we need to get used to. And because of this, I believe that validation is really important. Uh, so I believe that types are important. Why types are a great help. That's why I believe tests are really important and are a great help. And uh, things like code review, I think, are great. And um, I think sometimes we see like types versus tests as being like this battle, or at least some people do, um, where it's like you have to choose one or the other. Um, but I really think both are great. And if you don't think that tests are great, then we probably need to have a separate discussion because this may not be a talk for you. Uh, but I also do believe that bad tests exist, and we don't always apply the same level of um, critical thinking to our tests that we do to our code. Uh, so we're used to thinking about our code, thinking about like what is beautiful code, uh, what is really going to work well, what's going to be easy to change. Uh, we don't apply that same critical thinking to our tests, uh, but we need to realize that not all tests are great. We have um, tests that are slow, I think are bad, uh, tests that are hard to write, have a lot of setup. Uh, tests that are going to break, uh, that are fragile, um, or tests that aren't going to actually catch bugs. Um, all of those things are things that are bad, and we need to think about how do we write tests that are going to set us up for success. And finally, I believe the best code is the code that's easy to test. Okay? Humans are also very lazy, and easy tests get written and hard tests don't. And that's just the reality of life. And so we need to make tests easy to write so that we write them and so that our teammates write them. Um, there's too many times where if a test is hard to write, I just don't write it unless my teammates ask me to, right? But if something is easy to test, I'll write the test up front and do that because it's easy and often easier than actually reproducing the issue otherwise. And so tests actually provide us some feedback on the design of our code. They're sort of like reuse at a really small scale. And so we need to think about what is the, the test, what are the tests telling us about the design of our code? So automated tests can be split into unit tests and integration tests. I don't really like the term unit test because I think it's not very clear. I kind of wish that they were called isolation tests because that really gets to the heart of what's going on. We're either testing something by itself in isolation or testing things that we've put together uh, and that we're integrating. And there's a great talk by uh, J.B. Rainsberger, uh, who's someone who's well known in the Agile community, uh, called Integration Tests Are a Scam. And that was kind of the inspiration for the title of this talk. Um, and he talks about some of the problems that we have with integration tests. Uh, and one of the big things is that integration tests tend to be very slow. Uh, so he talks about how uh, as you add more functionality to your app, your test suite, the time it takes to run, grows more than linearly. And he says when you are writing integration tests, all the integration tests test many features. And so when you add new features, your existing tests all get slower. And then you also have to write new tests for the new functionality. And so integration tests... Um, lead to te slow test suites, which lead to slow feedback loops, and eventually means you stop running all the tests, and that's just not great. Um, I also believe that integration tests are a lot harder to write, and so there's just a lot of downsides to trying to go the integration test route, which is why people are so big on unit tests. Um, and test doubles are a technique for turning integration tests into unit tests. So a test double would be like a mock, or a fake, or a stub, or a spy. Um, and those things are, are ways that you take something that would be an integration test or that you couldn't test without an integration test, and you turn it into something where you're testing with a unit test. And so here's just a small example of a, a view controller uh, that loads uh, cat GIFs. And so you, it's got an image and a button, and it hits this Giphy service. And so when you press the button, it's going to call this method. It's going to ask for an image from the service and then show that in the image view. Now, if you're thinking about how you test this, you can't test this without actually hitting the Giphy service right now. You could write um, a network stub um, that could do it, uh, or you'd have to do something where you introduce like a protocol here, and then in your test you'd create a mock Giphy service, uh, and in the test you would then implement that method, the image for query method, in the test to just return a static image. And so that's how you would turn that integration test into a unit test. And the thing I want you to take away from that is that test doubles are used to verify effects. Uh, and this is kind of the key idea and the motivation behind this talk for me. Uh, 
So I think a lot of people, when they look at that previous slide, they'd say, well, it's not a fact. You're just, you're injecting a dependency, right? That's a dependency injection. Uh, but the reality is that dependency is just another word for effect. Uh, if you had something where you had a value that you're passing into there, uh, you would not think of that as a dependency. A dependency is something that isn't a value. And if it's not a value, it means that it has some state, either internal to that object or something where it's hitting the external world. Uh, and that state, whether it's internal or external, whether it's reading or writing, uh, is some sort of effect. Okay? So test doubles mean that you're verifying effects. Now, if we step back, our programs are a combination of logic and effects. There's different ways we can break this down or different terms we can use. We can talk about pure functions and impure functions, or we can talk about referentially transparent functions or referentially opaque functions. Basically, given the inputs to a function, can you determine what the output is going to be, or is the output dependent on some other state, uh, some other thing that's not just the inputs to that function? And our programs are going to be a combination of these, right? You're not just going to write a program that has some logic, but you can't like, observe the, the result at all. It's going to do something with that logic. And likewise, you're generally not going to just have a program that just does something without having some sort of logic in it. And so if we want to test these things, we're going to have to write tests for the logic and tests for the effects. And I believe that when you're testing, there tend to be very uh, much fewer effects to test, but they end up being a lot harder to test uh, because with an effect, you need to observe that state somehow. Uh, so whatever the effect is, you're taking some action, you need to figure out, like, how do I know whether that action actually happened? And so they're a lot harder to test. Um, but then logic, there tends to be a lot of cases, but they tend to be a lot easier to test. Right? If I'm testing a function that just has values in and values out, it's very easy, typically, to, to, corrupt, to construct some values pass that into the function, and see what value comes back, and then test that it's the correct value. Now, the interesting thing, I think, is that if we test our, if we combine our logic and effects in the same functions, I believe we get the, the worst of both worlds, right? We have many tests still, um, but they become very hard to test. And so all of our test suite gets a lot harder uh, and, and um, bigger. And... I believe this complexity also makes code harder to understand. I think one of the big things for me in the past few years has been thinking about locality in my code uh, and wanting to um, take things and put them into a small space. So instead of spreading logic over an entire view controller, I want to try and put that into a small space. Instead of trying to spread effects over a total area, I want to put those in a small place. And I think that's especially true if you're thinking about calling other functions. There's something about knowing that those functions have no effect other than returning a value that makes them very easy to reason about. But if you're calling methods and you don't know whether they have some effect and are doing something or the methods that they call or the methods that they call and so on down the line, if those start interacting with parts of the world, it makes it very hard for you to reason about what your code is actually going to do. And I think this is also very important for code reuse. Uh, we really want to separate the decisions from what we're doing from the actions that we're going to take. Um, if you think of like an example of maybe uh, wanting to email users who have an expired credit card, right? You're going to have some logic that says like these are the users that, that their credit card is expired, and then I'm going to email them. Well, if you put that together in one method that like does all of that work, you're probably not going to have much opportunity for reuse because your reuse would just be emailing users who have an expired credit card, which isn't that exciting. But if you split that out into the effects where you first generate a list of users who have expired credit cards, and then you have a way to email users, right? You can think of lots of times you might want to email users. You can think of different things you might want to do for users with expired credit cards, and splitting that uh, gives us more reuse. And so I want us to think when we're using test levels, it means that we're testing logic and effects together. And this is why I believe test levels are a scam. It's because I think test doubles legitimize poor architecture. They let us test, uh, they let us write our logic and effects together and feel good about it because we can write a unit test. Okay? And it's one of those techniques that's, I think, developed in a lot of ways for legacy code, right? Legacy code being code that has no tests, and we want to put that code under tests and write tests for it. And I think test doubles are great for that. Uh, and there's other techniques too, which I might use to write a unit test for a code that that I can't test well, 
and has no existing unit tests. But the key thing is that I don't think many of those techniques should be used other, in other places for new code, right? It's great to use test doubles to put legacy code on a test, but we shouldn't think because it's a good technique to use there that it's a good technique to use in general and that it means that our code is well-designed because I think it's not. And this is what leads me to functional programming. Okay, functional programming enforces purity, right? There's pure, pure functions. Uh, now, there are impure functional languages, but I would say that those impure functional languages are combining functional programming with some other functional, with some other programming paradigm. And so the functional programming piece is the part where you are returning values from functions, uh, and your, your functions are pure and referentially transparent. Because what functional and functional programming means is that it's functional in the mathematical sense. In a mathematical function, for any given inputs, you can only have one output, which means that it can't depend on any other state or have any other effect. It's just value in, value out. And in this world, there's no need for test doubles, right? If you're writing value in, value out, you don't need a test double because test doubles are there to verify effects. So I want to talk just a couple examples from some functional languages. Uh, Haskell is probably the most widely known functional language or has probably the best reputation. Um, and in Haskell, people use the I.O. monad. And an, I think it's very confusing most of the time for people with object-oriented backgrounds. Um, and I would not say that I'm an expert in this. Um, but the, the core idea is that instead of performing some effect, it's going to return this value that describes the effect that you want to have. So here's a couple functions. Get car gets a, a character from the command line and just returns that. Um, but it's not actually going to do that work and return the character. It's going to return this value that says, um, that's going to tell the language, like, actually do this effect. So actually read it from the command line and give me this character back. And we can go in the opposite direction. Put car takes a character and returns this IO, which describes the effect of putting that character to the command line. And we can combine those, right? We can take an IO of A, a function from A to B, and return an IO of B. And so here you can use that with get car and put car. And so you get a function that's going to return this value that describes the effect of reading a character from the terminal and then printing it back. Now, Haskell's great, but I really love Elm. And the reason I like Elm is because Elm takes all of these functional concepts from things like Haskell, and it simplifies them to the point where I can actually understand them and reason about them. Uh, and so I want to talk through a, a brief example in Elm that, that applies the same pattern. So this is uh, some code that I've taken from Evan CZ's Elm architecture tutorial. Evan is the creator of Elm. And so he has this great tutorial that he puts together um, that runs through kind of how Elm works. And I'd highly recommend going through that and learning it. I feel like I've learned a ton from Elm uh, as I've tried to play with it. And the way that Elm works is that they have what they call the Elm architecture. And the Elm architecture, you start with a model, which is this value that describes the state of your application. And then you have some sort of message type. So here's a message. Uh, there's two messages you can send. And the message affects the model. So you have this update function. It takes a message and a model and then returns a new copy of the model and returns some command. And a command uh, is a value that describes an effect. And then you'd have some view function that would take your model and render it to HTML. So in this case, this is another catgif view controller. And so when you click the button, that button is going to send this more please message back to the runtime. And then the update method, update function is going to be called with the more please message. And in that case there, it's going to return the existing model because clicking the button actually doesn't change anything. And then it's going to return this command that it gets from get random gif. And the way that that works is get random gif at the bottom here, it creates this URL, and then it returns this value from HTTP send. Uh, so it's interesting that HTTP send, it's not a side effect. It's not actually going to send the value. It's returning a command that describes sending uh, this request. And so what it's going to do is it's going to make that request. And when it's done with the request, it'll send this new GIF message into the update function and pass it. Uh, with that, it's got an associated value that's the uh, success or failure of that network request. And so this is like the functional core imperative shell idea. Uh, if you guys have watched Gary Bernhardt's talk, like boundaries, other things, uh, he talks about this idea of like, uh, 
you have this functional core to your application, which becomes very easy to test. It's values in and values out. And then you have something at the outside, which is the imperative shell. Uh, and this is, I think, the pattern we need to think about. Because when we're thinking about languages like Haskell or Elm, the reality is this pattern is there too. Okay? You're writing pure functions in Elm, and the, uh, the language runtime is the imperative shell. So I'm returning these values that describe the computation I want. The language actually does and has all these side effects and runs that at runtime, and then it hands me back the results. Uh, and this is also the idea behind things like React, where you're writing pure functions, uh, you're passing it off to this framework to do this thing, and then it's going to notify you uh, when things have changed, and you can just continue writing pure functions that are easy to test. So this is a Swift conference. Let's talk about Swift. Swift is an impure functional language, which means that effects can lurk anywhere. Uh, they're not part of the type system, which is convenient in many ways, but it means that you have to be very careful. Because in this case, this function, if we're just looking at its type signature, it takes in a string and returns a URL, we can't know from just the type signature whether or not that it's actually going to do any work or have any effect. And so this is where I think thinking about how we're going to test this is the ultimate test of the code. Right? If you wanted to test this right now, you would have to use a test double of some sort. And that's where I think uh, we need to think, be thinking about this, is a test double means I've written some effect, and I should be separating that effect out instead. And so here's one way that you could do that. Uh, and this is similar to one of the Swift Talk episodes that Chris and Florian did. Um, and so we have here some request uh, struct that describes a network request that we're going to make. And so it's not actually going to make the request. It's going to describe how we want to make the request. And so it has uh, some values, the URL and the parameters that describe the actual request we're going to make. And then we have a transform block that's going to take the raw data or error we get from the network and transform that into some value. Okay. And so then in our image function, image for query, instead of performing this effect, we're just going to return a request that describes how to make the request for the data and then how to transform it into the correct thing. So we're going to attempt map over it, uh, which is just like a version of map that can fail. And so if it fails, it'll convert it into an error. And what this means is that we've, we've taken the actual effect out. Okay, So we've left our code as it is, kind of. But if you think about it as being like a call hierarchy, like instead of putting the effect on the inside and the innermost method, we're taking that effect and moving it all the way to the outside and then returning values all the way up and down that describe what we want to do. And this is going to let us test this in ways that we couldn't do uh, with a more conventional imperative method. So we can test this without stubbing or mocking and verify that the URL and the parameters are correct. We can verify that this is going to hit the correct URL without trying to write some sort of like URL session uh, subclass type thing or instead of having to like use a URL protocol to verify that it's somehow like making the correct request, we can just ask for this value and then test that it has the right things. And on the other side, we can verify the decoding without actually having to make the request. So I can get this request back, and then I can just pass it a block of data, or I can pass it an error and verify that I get the correct URL or, the correct URL or, or value on the other side. And so I think this makes it a lot easier to test. Um, but it also makes it a little easier to reuse this and uh, reuse the logic in different ways. So if I wanted to transparently add caching, like I probably have some method that's going to take this request and actually perform it. Well, I could have that method just look at the URL and the parameters and look and see if I have some value that I've previously gotten for it uh, and, and stored and just return that instead of actually making the request. And this method doesn't need to know about it. Like I can make that decision somewhere else and uh, just add that on top. Or I could alter this request if I wanted. Uh, so I could maybe add some different parameters to it. I could change the URL if I wanted. Or I could map over it and create a different result at the end. Right? Like here I have a URL. Well, maybe I want to combine this in some other way and actually return an image or um, some data. Or I want to make another request and something like that. Um, or I could do something where I rate, rate limit requests. So instead of doing a caching thing, I can say, like, hey, if I made some requests recently, and if I have, like, maybe I don't want to make this request right now. 
Because instead of all of your effects like going off in different parts, you have all the values coming back and then all of the effects going through a single code path. So I think that example is maybe a little bit more familiar. Um, and so I want to talk about one more. And so this is kind of a hypothetical Slack bot. And so I have some command here that describes the effects that I can do on Slack. So maybe my bot can post a message or he can uh, react to some message with an emoji. And so then I write this uh, state struct, which is a handler. It has this one method called handle that takes in a message, uh, some message from Slack, and then returns an optional command of the thing I'd want to do. And so this uh, behaves as like a plus plus bot, where you do like MD plus plus, and it increments some count for me, and then keeps track of it. And so in this case, it's going to check to see like, hey, does this message match this format? And if so, what user is it? And if it does, it's going to increment the count for that user and then return a command that describes that it wants to thumb up my, uh, that message, whoever asked plus plus me, uh, so that you have some effect. And this is all pure, okay? There's this mutating word in here, right, that makes us think like it's more imperative, but the reality is that mutating is just kind of sugar for returning a new state and this, this other value, this command. And so this has the same structure as that update function in Elm, where it's taking an existing model, which is gonna be self, the state, it's taking some message, and then it's gonna return a new model, which is the state, and some optionally some command. And so I can write unit tests for this that are just passing in messages and then <coughs> verifying that they have the correct effect on the other end, or the correct command that comes out on the other end. And so I can verify that if I have this message, it's MD++, that the state is going to ask to uh, thumb up that message. And then on the outside, we have this, this system that's going to actually execute the values. And so uh, if we think about having this handler protocol that has that one method, the handle, um, and then we have some, some class, which is this bot. And the bot is actually going to run the server, it's going to listen for incoming requests. When there's an incoming request, it's going to pass it to the handler and then get some command back. And if there's a command, it'll actually execute it. And so we've pulled this effect out to the very outside. And we can test this much more simply than we could if we were trying to test the whole thing together. Uh, and we can also test our state uh, very easily. Now, if, if you think about like how you would write this with a more traditional object-oriented approach, Probably what you would do is you would have this class bot and you would have this handle message right on there. And then you would have to subclass it. And then in your handle method, you'd call some other method, like you'd call this method uh, react and pass it an emoji and a message, right? And so in that world, you'd have to subclass bot and verify that it called these correct methods and did these different things. So you have to verify all these effects with some sort of test double. And so I think it's, it's much easier to do this way. And it also leaves you with these pieces that are reusable in different ways, right? I've abstracted this, this part here, and then I can reuse uh, this bot to create other types of bots very easily. And the system that we're going to use can be different things. So in this case, the bot class plays the role of the system, which is going to actually make all of the effects. But it could be a UI view controller. It could be an application, a framework, uh, different things. But just think about this idea of, like, you want to... Instead of performing the effect, you want to create some values that describe the effect you want to make. You pass that back up the chain, and you have something go through a single code path to execute those. Now, I think that's a very interesting example, but I, probably most of us in this room work primarily with iOS apps and write things either UI kit or app kit. And kind of the question for me when we talk about these things is always, well, that's a neat idea, and I agree but I don't know how that applies to the work that I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so how do we do that? And I think the reality is that it's going to be, our ability to do this is somewhat limited by the fact that UIKit is so object-oriented because it's just throughout the whole system. And if we want to be part of that system and write an app, we need to have code that's object-oriented. And kind of the approach people take to this is they start thinking in components, where they talk about like this component is gonna be there, and this is the thing that's going to like have state and effects, and then the inside of that is going to be um, functional. And I just want to point out, like, when you use the word component, what you really just mean is object. We're talking about things that have state and have behaviors, and 
we use component because that sounds better than object, but really component is just an object. Okay, so we, we're gonna have some limited ability to remove our effects in here unless we do something like, um, like React does where you have some sort of like virtual UI layer, which different systems have done, where instead of actually manipulating all the UI kit stuff, you have like this um, virtual UI that returns all the values and let it calculate diffs and do all that kind of stuff. And so this is a pattern that uh, we've been applying and I just want to talk through a small example. So in this example, this would be like in a Twitter app that you have like an activity page, uh, activity tab that shows you just a table with different activity that's happened. So someone's replied to your tweet, they've followed you, they've liked a tweet, they've retweeted. And in this case, we have been creating these enums called a row. And the row is kind of like a semantic description of what that row would be. So it's what type of row it is and then it has some data. And so when we're thinking like logically as a user, like what different types of rows there are, that's the different types of rows that are in this. And then we have the cell, which is like a type erased uh, UI table view cell that knows how to create the UI table view cell for that row. And then we have some action, which is like the command um, that describes the action we want to take when we click on this, when we tap on this row. And so we have our actions here that then um, can be performed with some data. And then we have a list of rows at the very end. And the nice thing about the system is that it's testable at all the different layers. So given a, a particular row, we can create a UI table view cell and do a snapshot test of that and verify it's gonna render in the correct way. We can, for a given row, verify that tapping on it will uh, take the correct action because it's just a value that we're gonna get back and so we can test that. Uh, and then we can test that given the correct data that goes into this view model, that we're gonna get the correct rows back. And so then we, we hook it up into a view controller uh, that's got the view model and then has this perform block that's going to be a block that takes one of its actions and then has some effect, right? Void means it's, it's gonna have some effect in the background. Um, and then we have our UI table view methods. And they become very simple with one liners, so very minimal branching, which requires minimal testing, right? It's very hard for view model.rows, uh, subscript.cell that makes cell to go wrong. Because we've verified that rows is going to have the correct thing. We've verified that rows.cell is going to create the correct thing. Uh, and so we've moved kind of all the testable concerns outside of this. And the same is true for the action. Like we just ask like, hey, is there an action? And if there is, we pass it to this block that's going to go up the chain. And this is still stateful. Uh, but instead of uh, executing the effects, it's going to request that something else make them. And so then at the root, we're going to have this view controller that's going to um, instantiate all of the view controllers. And at the bottom here, we have uh, a different ena action enum. And it's going to do with like a reducer in React where it's going to take the action from whatever uh, sub like screen or whatever view controller. And it's going to trans like translate that action into one of the root actions that can be taken. And then we have this perform block that's going to switch over the actions that we can take, and then it knows how to show a tweet. And so it's gonna take that tweet value out and actually push on a view controller that's gonna show that tweet. And the things that I think are interesting about this is that we have this Twitter activity view controller and this tweet view controller, and these are now entirely decoupled, right? Twitter activity view controller has no knowledge of tweet view controller. It only knows how to say, hey, I wanna show a tweet, and then something else closer to the root says, oh, I know how to show a tweet, and it pushes a view controller. And we can reuse that code in different, different ways, right? There's gonna be other screens that wanna show tweets, and those can just pass back another action, and that just gets translated from one action type to another, and at the root, we show the action. And so all of our effects are going through a single code path, and we can have, just in one spot, be creating that view controller. So instead of, in all of your view controllers being creating other view controllers and passing those on, where all of those view controllers now have knowledge about what view controllers are showing. All of that knowledge is encoded kind of in this root layer, uh, and then the, the inner parts just know how to ask for effects. And so this is the kind of system we've been playing with and trying to figure out like how far can we push this and like what are you know, the limitations of this. And so far I think we've been having a lot of success. Um, kind of our, our newer thing now is we've added this other effect um, type that an action can have return an effect that describes a more generic effect. So instead of 
uh, returning that it wants to show a tweet, it'll return effect that says, hey, I want to push, and then it's going to pass a view controller. And then I can still test that uh, and have this value that comes back that's going to describe the thing I want to do, but it's not actually going to uh, go off and do it. So that is all I had. Um, if you guys are interested in learning more about this, there's a couple related talks I pulled out here. Uh, Boundaries by Gary Bernhardt is, I think, one of the best talks I've ever seen, where he talks about this functional core imperative shell idea. And he goes through an example of a, a Twitter client that he wrote in Ruby on the command line uh, that describes some of it. It's really great. Uh, integration tests are a scam by J.B. Rainsberger, talking about integration tests and what problems there are with them and how they can be addressed. And then this other talk I really like called The Clean Architecture in Python by Brandon Rhodes. Um, and although it's in Python, it's really more about value programming and how passing around values can clean up the architecture of your application. And so I highly recommend that one as well. Yeah. There's a lot of great talk. Uh, there's a lot of these ideas in our one place where I have problems with like from a like I'm not I'm not like hybrid and forgetting, but actually correct an idea. Yes. And so that's an idea we've just started to play around with more um, to figure out how to do that. And what I've been doing is kind of basing our approach uh, on what Elm does. And so when I talked about this request type, um, this is tying into it. So what happens is we return this effect that says, hey, I want you to make this network request. And so we'll pass back um, one of the enum values will be like uh, web task. And then I'll return this thing, it's a request, and then I'll have mapped over the request so that the result value of the request is going to be another action. And so you pass back, like, hey, make this request, and then tell me the action when you're done. And so then I can have some effect. It gets a little bit trickier, like, trying to actually put it back to the view controller that it originated from, um, which we're just doing, like, in a couple cases right now, like, if we have errors. And so we have, like, a generic way to pass back an error to the requesting view controller. But we haven't really had other applications yet to play around with passing around other types of actions back to the you control that made the request. Uh, yeah, great talk. Thanks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah. And kind of the interesting thing about the pattern that we've been using here is instead of creating this really deep tree, what we've ended up doing is creating this really broad tree, right? Because it, kind of in a traditional, like, if you're trying to pass everything into the initializer of a view controller, typically what happens is you end up passing everything into that view controller, and then that view controller wants to create this other view controller, and it needs these other things. And so then you add all of those types, like, all the way up the classes till you get to the root view controller. And so now everything is getting passed, like, everything in. Um, and so then if you want to go the other direction and pass stuff back, like, it has to go all the way up the chain. But what we've done here instead is you only have, like, one layer to go. Uh, and so the, this tweet view controller, like, even show, shown from the Twitter activity one, like, sure. you're not reducing the tweet view controller action into the Twitter view Twitter activity view controller action and then into the other action. It's just going from one action type kind of to the oh, root. Yeah, sorry, I meant like Oh, yeah. You know, you may have like Yeah. Yeah, and we've been trying to play around more with like having multiple kind of like roots. Um, yeah. And so trying to play around like what what's the best way to do that? Okay, so you don't have anything. Yes, yeah. <laughs> basically. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I don't think it really has an impact. Um, basically, you just you still write the tests first for everything, but it's just the, the tests are just value in, value out. So I think if anything, it maybe makes it a little easier because instead of having to think about like what, how is this uh, view controller going going to look in the long term, you can think more about like I'm just writing this one function that's going to do like value in, value out. And specifically, when we've been doing this pattern with the rows, like, we do a lot of table views. And so we, like, we kind of know now that it's really easy for us to create a new row type. Like, we know how to do this because it's just like, yeah, the first thing I want to do is create my, my view controller, view model, which is going to be empty. And then the next thing I want to do is create a row type in there. And I'll verify that it's going to do the snapshot test. I'll verify the action. And then I'll verify that the view model itself creates the, the correct rows. And so you can still do all the tests first for that. But the problem space is well known. Covering developing an API. Most people use the test first to cover problem space. Problem space. Yes, yes. Um, but I think. Like, it's, it's tough, but I, I think this is, like, you have to shift your way of thinking, and then you start to think about it in this way, and you can apply kind of the same approach. Because um, this is really solving the same problems that protocols would. Like, protocols are just there so that you can do the testable thing. Um, and so it's kind of, you just have to think about it differently, but I think it's the same from a testing perspective. Other, other than I think that writing value tests are easier. <laughs> 